Welcome everyone. It is a huge pleasure to have Peter Barber of Peter Barber Architects here today to talk about his work and a huge pleasure to welcome all of you who are here to hear about his work. We have registrants from across the United States and around the world with us today from Mexico to South Africa to Bahrain to Great Britain to New Zealand. A hearty welcome to you all. I'm Rosalie Ginevro, the Executive Director of the Architectural League. And before I introduce Peter, I would just like to say thank you to our co-presenter of this lecture, the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture of the Cooper Union. And thank you to the New York State Council on the Arts and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, whose support helps make this lecture and all league programs possible. I also wanna thank all the members of the Architectural League whose support is absolutely crucial to the league's capacity to plan and present programs like this. Um, throughout, throughout the pandemic, we've made all of our programs free and accessible to anyone who is interested. Um, and it's membership support that helps make that possible. Our membership is national and international and we most cordially invite you to join us. If you're not a member, please go to our website at archleague.org and join today. Today's lecture is the first of our fall and early winter current work series which presents four programs with people who have made really significant contributions to advancing design and thinking in housing. Coming up, we have Anne Lacaton, Jean-Philippe Vassal, and Frederick Duro in November, Yasmin Lari in December, and Andrew Freer and Rusty Smith in January. You can find out, sorry, you can find more information about these lectures and much, much more that the League has on offer um, on our website. Peter Barber has been steadily producing extremely good architecture for many years now, but one could say with very good reason that 2021 is the year of Peter Barber. Last week, his McGrath Road project won the RIBA Neve Brown Award, named after one of the most important and admired members of the generation of post-war architects who created the remarkable legacy of council housing in Britain. Peter also won the Architects Journal Contribution to the Profession Award, which is chosen by a poll of employees of the journal's AJ100 firms. The office also won four RIBA design awards in the latest round of that annual competition. The genius of Peter's work comes from recognizing that one of housing's major obligations is to serve as a building block of the urban fabric and an insistence that there is a lot to be learned from housing typologies of the past that others have declared obsolete. He designs a street-based architecture that emphasizes sociability and projects through lots of direct connection to the street and common spaces. And to do that is extremely inventive in finding new ways to introduce light and account for circulation in his designs. Peter's had his own practice since 1989 after working for Richard Rogers and partners, Will Alsop and Jessica and Wiles. Peter's practice is small, just six people right now. And that small team has produced some of the best housing affordable or otherwise in Britain in recent years. And it, it is a model of practice and a um, outspoken commentary on political economy and the profession that serves as a beacon and guidepost for other practices. Following Peter's presentation, we'll be joined for discussion by Florian Eidenberg, principal of SOIL, who's designing some innovative housing of his own, including several projects with Tank House Development in Brooklyn and the Las Americas Social Housing in Leon, Mexico. Also joining us will be Sarah Watson, Deputy Director of the Citizens Housing and Planning Council, who's conducted path-breaking research on changing households and, house and housing demand in New York and the need for housing policy and housing design to recognize and reshape itself to respond to those changes. Sarah and CHPC have also looked at what lessons London's recent work to revivify its council housing might hold for New York City. We'll also welcome questions from the audience following the, the lecture and discussion. Please use the Q&A function on Zoom to ask your question. Much easier for us to pick up there rather than in chat. So over to you, Peter. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I think uh, I'd just like to say, uh, 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 well, thank you so much, Rosalie, for that lovely introduction. Uh, it, you know, really nice. And thanks also very much for this invitation to come and talk 
uh, to the Architecture League and to all the people who are attending today. It's a, a great honor to be here and, and um, thank you very much. I'm gonna show you, you, as you perhaps expect, some pictures of our stuff, both built and in the end unbuilt. The 100 mile city was, will be where we end. But before I do that, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, our office and how it works. Uh, but before that, talk a little bit, bit about the context in which we work. Uh, the political context, the historic and geographical context, um, which is really everything to us. And also to give you some quotes uh, from people I admire, uh, which underpin some of the ideas which lie at the heart of what we do. It's good to have some sort of kind of moral uh, underpinning, some kind of um, uh, some foundations for what you do. And um, the words of people like Walter Benjamin come back to me over and over again. So I should be quoting him and one or two other people to set the scene for uh, our, you know, our, our ideological position, I suppose. So let's share a screen. Isn't this all very strange? There we go. Um, so the, this first image is of a march that we went on a few years ago, and it's a reminder of the, ter the, the tremendous crisis that we find ourselves in in this country. London, one of the richest cities in the world, has 7,000 street uh, homeless people uh, living in doorways, in subways. Uh, so we have to step over them as we come out of the, uh, the metro in the morning. Um, it's a scandal. And that scandal is a consequence of the mismanagement of the land economy in our country by our government uh, over the last 50 or so years. It was all going rather well before that. In the aftermath of the Second World War, our country was broke. Uh, but nevertheless, because we were determined to do it, we were able, it seems, to have built 150,000 social housing units each year, so that by 1977, nearly half the population of the country enjoyed the benefits of inexpensive uh, homes living in social housing, housing built for the people, by the people. It was a fantastic achievement by an earlier generation. But in 1977, the thatcher Heseltine Housing Act was brought in, which effectively outlawed the uh, construction of social housing and introduced a law which said it was possible for social housing tenants to buy their homes at a discount. Uh, and the outcome of that is that the, the number of people living in social housing has diminished from 50% to 15% with the attendant problems of homelessness that we have in our country. Right, I'm trying to go forward with this, Jonah. Okay, next slide. Um, so this is what it's kind of looking like in London at the moment. Um, and I'm getting, you know, social housing being demolished and being replaced by for sale housing. Uh, and the market uh, takes uh, precedence at every turn. We have, uh, you know, the, the situation has been abandoned to um, the market. Uh, uh, and, and so we are knocking down social housing like this. Our Prime Minister in 2016, get this, David Cameron said, and I think this is a disgrace by the way, post-war estates across the country are ripe for redevelopment. We will sweep away the planning blockages and take new steps to reduce political and reputational risk for projects, key decision makers and investors. I believe that together we can tear down anything that stands in our way. And so this is what we get in its place. This is an area in South London, it's in Battersea. Those of you living in cities around, some many cities around the world will probably be familiar with scenes like this, where global capital has come swirling through, wiped out everything in its path and is producing for, for investors and for pension funds, uh, housing of this sort, uh, we have in London 30,000 empty homes. So, so housing seen not as uh, basic uh, infrastructure, but as commodity, as investment vehicle. And, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a shame. And I keep walking around the corner in London and finding another block, a familiar old building having disappeared uh, to the wrecking ball and more of this stuff going up. And the outcome is this, as I say, 7,000 street homeless, 150,000 people in London living in insecure accommodation. Um, and in a way, I, I say we all share responsibility in this, all us Londoners, 
we live in a democracy, we have the, the ballot box, we have a relatively free press, we have direct action. We need to be doing something about this. Uh, it's been going on for far too long. This is a photograph taken on a disposable camera by a homeless person. A friend of mine is doing a project with homeless people, giving them disposable cameras, to take pictures of their own environment, a pavement bedroom. And this is somebody else's bedroom. This is a 15 million pound one bedroom apartment in uh, West London. So this is about inequality. It's about um, an ide ideological position which uh, puts housing and, and uh, the sharing of resources very low down uh, on a list of priorities so that we have this, these awful inequalities. Um, a, a number of really simple things could be done in housing policy. I mean, you know, um, political parties of both persuasions have been responsible for very, you know, left and right, very poor housing policy. Um, but uh, I, I believe that what we need to do is to end the right to buy, end the right uh, that people have to buy their council house at a discount. It sounds like a nice idea, but under, uh, underneath it all, it undermines everything that we are trying to do because it, it leads to, to, to the, the diminishing of, of the council housing stock, social housing stock. We need to have rent controls, but most of all, we need to have a substantial social housing pr uh, program, probably of the scale that they had, as I say, in the aftermath of the war, when this country could ill afford it. We were building a health service at the same time. So we could do it. It's just a political will that's required. This brings me to, to a, a, a series of slides, which is sort of more conventionally architectural, I suppose. Uh, and this, uh, I'm going to give you a little quote from Walter Benjamin, the great Walter Benjamin. And this is a, a picture of the city of Naples. Benjamin in, the in 1924 wrote a book called One Way Street. And each chapter in that book describes a city in Europe, a European city. And the one that really captured my imagination is his description of the city of Naples. Because it sort of talks about a, a city which only becomes interesting when it becomes occupied by people. It, it gives an, as an intimation of the complex reciprocal relationship which exists between people and architecture, between culture and space. On the one hand, we make our cities, don't we? But on the other hand, they come back and impact on us. So it kind of goes backwards and forwards. It goes both ways. Uh, cities can liberate us or they can imprison us depending on how they are. But his description of Naples is rather wonderful because as I say, it talks about that wonderful relationship and as architecture and the city being really nothing until it's, it, has the, it is occupied by people, as you can see in this picture. So I'll read what you, you what he has to say about that. It's rather beautiful, I think. The passion for improvisation demands that space and opportunity be at any price preserved. Buildings are used as a popular stage. They're all divided into innumerable simultaneously animated theatres, balcony, courtyard, window, gateways, staircase and roof are at the same time stages and boxes. As porous as the stone is the architecture, buildings and action interpenetrate in the courtyards, arcades and stairways. In everything, they preserve the scope to become a theatre of new unforeseen constellations. The stamp of the definitive is avoided. No situation appears intended forever. And when we're designing our projects, imagining how people might behave, what they might be encouraged to do, what the architecture and the spatial structures that we're creating might tend to, how they might tend to influence and empower people is never far from my thinking. It's, no, it's, not, a, it's not a blank sheet of paper for very long. Like there are the people kind of um, in my imagination when I'm thinking about what we're designing. And I can thank Walter Benjamin for making me think like that. This is a picture of a street, strange enough. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's strange for me to be lecturing people in New York about streets because, you know, what, what better place is there for streets? But I just think sometimes familiar things are worth looking at again. Uh, this is a street in Brighton where I spend some of my time. It's a beautiful street-based city, uh, Victorian mostly. Um, and um, I, th I think streets are the basic building blocks of cities and that most experiments with other forms of urban organisation are less successful. Um, I think streets are an easy way of navigating the city, a good axial or gridiron system of streets make it easy for people to understand the city and to walk around it. Again, axial streets tend to create visual connections between adjacent neighborhoods, perhaps rich neighborhoods, perhaps poor neighborhoods are connected in that through, through the sort of visual um, 
penet permeability that's, that's possible with streets. A street like this brings people into close proximity. It's narrow. It brings old people, young people, people from different socioeconomic groups, different racial groups together uh, in a very informal setting. So at the very least, they're visible to one another. It's a place that feels safe. You know, Jane Jacobs, eyes on the street. There are loads of windows. Even when there aren't people on this street, there are loads of windows looking down into this space so that we never really feel quite alone or unsafe. Uh, it's obviously a very colourful scene. Uh, there is a multitude of different uses going on here. There's, there's ha homes upstairs, there's shops on the street, there's a pub on the corner. Uh, and so it's kind of visually kind of enticing and interesting. In a city like London, 70% of all of the buildings in London are houses or housing. So when we do housing, we really do try to think of it as pieces of cities. Uh, uh, our streets are lined with housing. Our squares are surrounded by housing. Housing is what makes a hard edge to the street and to the city, uh, and it's what our city is made of. This is an image which is a reminder for me to talk to you about public space. And again, you might say, well, we know what public space is, but I think there's something rather magical about it. Public space belongs to everybody and it belongs to nobody at the same time. This is the square at the edge, kind of almost like a clearing at the edge of the city of Marrakesh, Morocco where in the, cool, in the cool of the evening, the, um, the little alleyways and tiny streets of the, uh, of the city empty themselves of people into this space. And the most fantastic, you know, I think Benjamin would, would have liked it, the most fantastic theatrical kind of event unwinds, unfolds as little kitchens are shuttled out. It's a very festive atmosphere. Little kitchens are pulled out and produce kind of restaurants out of nowhere. Deus is dragged out and people start doing performances. Circles of people form themselves around snake charmers. It's the most wonderful scene. And that, that, that kind of sense of public space being a space in which people can be themselves and kind of within the kind of constraints of, of social etiquette in, in, each, in each city, but it, it's kept quite, quite, quite wonderful. And um, it's reinforced by the name of this space, which is Gemma al Fanar, which means a mosque of nothing. And I, and I love the idea of, of, of public space being a mosque of nothing, where people, as I say, can, can express themselves and be themselves to a significant extent. And that reading of this space is reinforced by the fact that behind the photographer in this picture, with all this ephemeral architecture and lightness uh, and, 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 and ever-changing kind of uh, action and activity, is the uh, ancient mosque of Marrakesh, with its two meter thick walls, uh, solid, permanent, unchanging, and perhaps symbolic of an unchanging ideology. And its counterpoint in, in public space uh, of Gemma al Fanar itself is, I think, uh, you know, very poetic in a way and, and instructive when we think about public space. This is us. I'm, stand, I'm sitting inside that room there. And uh, we live, we live, well, we do actually live here, don't we, 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 it's, we kind of work here and, uh, uh, and, um, uh, it's a lovely kind of domestic environment. And, and I'm fascinated by the fact that, by the idea of a shop front or a storefront. And I want to read you another quote. This is from Lena Bobardi, another great hero of mine. And she says this about having a shop front, which I think is really wonderful. The city is a public space, a great exhibition, offering all kinds of subtle readings. And anyone who has a shop, a window display, or any showcase of this kind has to assume a moral responsibility which requires that their window display might help to shape the taste of the city dwellers, help to shape the face of the city and reveal something of its essence. Um, I like that. And I hope that uh, Lena Bobardi would approve of what's, what we're doing here, because uh, this is our models. And this is where I'm sitting now, it's our meeting room. As Rosalie says, we're a very small office of six people. We're very analog. We work with uh, physical models and we work with pencils rather than computers in the design stages of projects. I don't think there's any substitute. I don't think the computer model is any substitute for a physical model. We make them at different scales. Oh, this is our roof terrace, by the way. So um, it's a, a journalist recently described our little six, seven person office as less of an office and more of a dinner party. And uh, this is where we sit and have our lunch. And, you know, it's a very, because it's a small office, there are great relationships between the people who work here and we are incredibly efficient in the way we work. Uh, and it's a kind of happy environment for working. As I say, we work with a pencil rather than a computer. So these are a series of sketches of, of, of a variety of projects, you know, the right hand one being, bottom right hand one being from eye level 
other ones being kind of more looking at the form, the massing of the buildings from above. But we designed by having layers of yellow paper uh, and, and kind of overlaying and the, the, the design process is a gradual one of, of a project kind of morphing and changing through being overlaid in pencil on see-through yellow paper. And these are sort of uh, snapshots of, 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 of various points in that process. Okay, and they're not they're not they're not presentation drawings, there, but but they occasionally become that by us scanning them in and dropping a bit of color in. We make models at different scales. It's obviously an urban scale. It's a foam model. It's produced very rapidly. Uh, we make them ourselves because we want to be able to hack bits off. Uh, it's a dynamic uh, and exciting process. The idea of a machine making a model for me would be uh, an anathema because we wouldn't be in control of the process. The model itself is the design process. Uh, and as we get more into the project, we get into more detail and as windows go on, uh, it helps us to understand our context, particularly when we're working with these very tight courtyard types with these narrow streets, we really need to understand proximities and the model, physical model is the only means by which we can really do that effectively. And then we get into more detail with one to 50 models so that we can see the interior of our projects and some of these models come apart so we can show our clients the interior. So they're good for communication with clients uh, and they're good for us to be able to understand the projects as well. This is the first of the built projects. How are we doing? Not too bad. Um, uh, we're in Donnybrook. We're in the East End of London. And this is a project which really changed my life because it's a competition that we won uh, uh, 20 or so years ago. And uh, it is a, it's a, it's, it's a social housing scheme. It's 50 homes. And we won it from over 150 people who took part. So it's an extraordinary thing. And in common with the kind of soundtrack that you've been hearing from me, it's not just an apartment building sitting in the middle of a site, which is I think what most people expected from the competition. It's just two streets which open out at their intersection to create a square. And the housing is fitted in around that. And it makes a hard edge to the corner uh, here and to a curve to the, the street here. So it really is in the first instance a piece of urbanism. And there it is in three dimensions. Uh, the, the, the streets and the square. Um, the housing typology itself is unusual and it's a, it's a denser scheme than it really looks, not super dense, but it's a relatively suburban, suburban location. And it's dense because what we're looking at here in each of those sort of L-shaped elements is two units. There's a ground floor uh, apartment accessible through a front door, a purple front door there, uh, and there's a gate which leads up to a first floor apartment. So every unit in this relatively dense project has its own front door on the street, and it has its own piece of outside space in the form of a courtyard. It's a strange hybrid. We've got, we're very used to having uh, terraced housing in London. It's very, you know, it's ubiquitous, uh, but this is a peculiar uh, hybrid of courtyard and terraced housing. And it's also a reworking of a, oh look. Yeah, that's so, uh, but the other thing that's going on here is that it's, it's back of pavement terraced housing. The orthodoxy at the time was to say, you need to have a front garden to protect you from the city defensible space, they called it. And I said to our clients, look, don't worry about front gardens, come and see what can happen when people take control of the space outside of their house. It could be absolutely magical. And that's my little house down in Brighton. Uh, and, and you know, what can happen in relationships between neighbors, uh, friendships which can emerge, or at least, you know, um, people get, getting to know each other and, and, and perhaps even just, just kind of uh, recognize one another. It's, uh, that kind of housing helps to kind of foster that kind of social logic. Um, and as I say, uh, the Donnybrook project is a, a reworking of this type of housing where you have two front doors next to each other. One leads into a ground floor flat. The, four, the, the other door leads into an upper flat. There is no common area circulation here, which is, uh, you know, so that people, so the street itself becomes the circulation of the project. This is another precedent and you'll, you'll see why I like precedents. They can reassure people with, that our client was also worried about roof terraces. You know, what, how does that work? And I took them to see this wonderful project. This is second and third floor. Uh, and you can see the notch profile, which we kind of borrowed. Um, and, and so these are roof gardens and roof terraces and a really magical place. Uh, and, you know, obviously Victorian precedent, which we were able to take people to and reassure them. So there it is. And there's the plan. So ground floor, the green one is a ground floor apart, apartment on one floor, accessible directly from the street with a back garden. And the pink one is an upper unit 
you go up an external stair into a courtyard and walk into the unit that way. So one, one unit on top of another. There you have the gate and the green door. And a very intimate relationship between the building and the street, you know, oriel windows projecting out over the street become like display cabinets, you know, bunches of flowers get put in there, cuddly toys. And, um, you know, the balcony overhanging the street, a place for the first cigarette of the day off your bedroom. The project is effectively a grid of, of forms, but there are little elements which become more prominent. Uh, and to that extent, I suppose you might, uh, you might argue that our work is kind of picturesque or filmic or cinematic. I'm very interested in the way that space unfolds as you move through the city uh, and buildings reveal themselves uh, to you and, 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 you know, events reveal themselves to you as you move around. And I think it's a really important way of thinking about things as well as the plan, the more abstract plan. Um, this is a image of the backs and the key to Donnybrook's success and its density is there's very little space between the backs. Usually terrace housing in our country has to be 30 meters or 30 yards apart uh, to protect people's privacy. But the key to Donnybrook is that there are no significant windows in the back and so no overlooking problems. We only got eight meters between the backs of these homes and they get their outlook by having an views over the street, but also views sideways, each one into its own private courtyard. That's the usual terraced housing, very, very land hungry, a rather low density. Um, so Donnybrook and, that, and the typology we developed there enabled us to um, you know, increase the density very significantly while doing terraced housing rather than blocks of flats. And it's lovely to see people move in. Again, I think Benjamin would like this, to see people moving in and taking control of those courtyards and the spaces as they occupied. And look at that. Doesn't always happen, you can't predict it, but by creating these courtyard spaces, you give people the opportunity to do this kind of stuff. Little quirks on the corners. Um, the front doors at Donnybrook have got glazed panels in them, and we thought that'd be a splendid idea so that people could, could see visitors as they arrived. Of course, that's rubbish. Nobody wants to be seen when they're, when they're looking through the front door. Uh, that's why people have those little spy holes. And what is lovely at Donnybrook is that people have uh, responded well to our mistake. And on every single occasion I've been there, every single door uh, of every single home has uh, a little picture in it, which is just a delight from my perspective. So we've repeated the, the, uh, the mistake many times since. The next project is not too far away from the last one. Uh, it's another project in uh, the East End of London. And we were asked to look at these three garages and stores on the left-hand side of the picture. It's a, social, it's a, it's a council housing estate from the post-war period, quite a, quite a depressing kind of spot. But I got interested in these fences and the gardens that they contained and the way that people seem to be empowered in these spaces to do stuff and put, you know, whirly gigs and, and sheds and uh, you know plants and stuff like that. And so we tapped into that and our proposal became an extension of those fences into a building which was also made out of timber and which formed the fourth side of a square uh, which would surround that grass patch you saw on the first picture. Our client was expecting three homes, we managed to get eight or ten by doing this rather strange again um, typology, there's the model of it. Um, each of these is a very large house which houses an extended family. That's a six or seven bedroom house, I think. These are four and five bedroom houses. They don't have gardens, they have, they're, they're blind backs. In other words, they don't have windows that look into the back, but they look out over the garden and sideways into these courtyards. So each one of those is a house. So not only were we able to get eight or nine units rather than three, we also placed a great deal of emphasis on this shared space between new residents and the existing residents who had gates put into their uh, into their fen the fences, uh, and there's a shared now a shared garden in the middle with a playground, uh, and it's become the, this this space in the middle has become the glue which kind of brings people together. And after school, it's fantastic to go there and see kids playing out there in the garden. Is the plan of it? Eight nine houses with lots of roof terraces, but no actual gardens. And to go back again and to see this. This is in the pumpkin season. This, it becomes sort of pumpkin city then, and lots of pumpkin curries being made there. I'm going to talk a little bit about back-to-back -back housing. Um, this is kind of 
I mean, I mean, this whole talk's a bit London-centric, I'm afraid, for all of you in kind of far-flung parts of the planet, but I suppose it's inevitable in a way. Back-to-back -back housing is a type of terraced housing which uh, was very common in the Victorian period. And it's housing which, unlike most terraced housing, the back wall, rather than facing into a garden, shares a back wall with houses facing the other direction. So, for instance, in this uh, photograph here, the houses face only onto this alleyway. The, uh, they, they, there is a blind back, there is a brick wall at the back, and so no views out that, out that way. I mean, this has been kind of very widely discredited as slum housing, and much of it, most of it was knocked down uh, in the early part of the last century, but some of it survived. And I'm fascinated by it because it's a way of getting uh, rather high densities because you're not making back gardens at all. But it's also a kind of creates a kind of social scene like this, which is I, which I because every, everybody's investing all of their efforts in the space at the front of their house because they have no space at the back and the neighborliness that goes with that. That's an example in the south of France, in a, in a town in the south of France, which I took, which I really love. So we thought it'd be interesting to experiment with this type. Uh, I was quite nervous about it because I said it's, it's kind of been very much discredited. But we did it at McGrath Road, which is a, a project just, just won quite a big prize, as Rosalie said. Um, it's in a, within an existing estate. Um, that is a row of houses facing out onto the street. And there is another row of houses backing onto it, which faces into a central square. And there it is again. So each one of those green, green roofs faces, uh, has a facade facing this way. And these are other houses facing into the courtyard. And I went to a back-to-back -back museum out of the 30,000 back-to-back houses which had existed in Birmingham in the Midlands in, in the UK. I went and visited, they, they saved eight of them as a museum. And I was shown around by back-to-back -back dwellers who'd been kicked out of their homes when they were bulldozed in the, in the 60s. Uh, so I was shown around by some people who had lived in back-to-back -back housing in Birmingham. They'd been moved out into tower blocks on the edge of town. And they said how much they missed this world that had been taken away from them. Yes, there were significant issues with plumbing and with ventilation and so on, but these weren't ins insurmountable. And I think it really was throwing out the baby out with the bathwater to de demolish this stuff. Uh, and uh, this was the message one got from the people who I spoke to who had lived in this type of housing. So emboldened by that trip, we came back and we worked up the scheme. Uh, and there it is, it got built. It's always a miracle to me when these things happen. You, a sketch suddenly turns into a project, which is not sudden, is it? But um, when it does eventually turn into a project. So each one of those is a house, the archway and those glass doors lead into a kitchen. On the next floor up, there's a bedroom. The next floor up, there's a bedroom. And on the very top floor, there's a lovely living room up in the sunshine with a courtyard. So this is very high density housing, despite the fact it's only four stories high. Uh, again, not high density by Manhattan standards, but it, but it is a, a very efficient and high density uh, street based housing for the kind of location it's in. There's the ground floor kitchen. And there's the top floor with its little courtyard up in the sunshine. And it's, again, it's lovely to go back and, and see people moving in. Doesn't always happen, but it, but it's lovely when it does. And you know, this is exactly what we'd hoped for and anticipated by giving people this kind of recess uh, and to and to really celebrate the entrance of their home. I mean, we work at all different scales, so we're up to kind of six stories here. This is a project where the same kind of logic applies. We're fascinated by the street. So in a normal apartment building, there's a single point of access, and very often, if it's residential at the ground floor, it can be pretty dead. On this project, we have created a series of maisonettes which go along the street. And so there are multiple points of access into the building. Uh, and again, it's getting quite lived in now. So these courtyards are getting quite fruity and nice. And um, we love the idea that in years to come, this facade will be sort of engulfed in people's greenery and their bikes and their stuff. And you know, the architecture will become background to people's world complex building, uh, and I think visual complexity on large buildings is, is a good idea. It's, it makes them interesting and, you know, kind of monotony with large buildings can be a problem. There's a little courtyard at the back, shared courtyard at the back, and there's an interior uh, with a view out onto a roof terrace on the upper floors, and again, another roof terrace. 
And again, another bigger building. And again, a great deal of emphasis on the street and on the square. Actually, this forms one side of a new civic square. We've got a supermarket, but there's a civic offices and a community college on the other side of the square. Uh, and this colonnade became an important feature of that square and other uh, buildings, which, which came later, kind of replicated that and, uh, as a continuous, continuous colonnade around that square. Fairly conventional building, this one, in terms of you know, the way that the cores work. We kind of, kind, of, kind of call it kind of donut block because there's a hollow out of the middle with private gardens in it. But in many ways, that, this project and the previous one are a reworking of, of a kind of a Victorian type mansion block or tenement block as one of the interiors. So one isn't always looking for something new. I, I always looking for reassurance in precedence. Uh, and uh, um, you have gathered that perhaps. So this is a, a bit of the talk, which is about the reuse of old buildings. And there are powerful ecological reasons for not knocking buildings down. And uh, there are issues which I'm going to air with, with Jane Jacobs, a quick quote from Jane Jacobs. Um, and in this, she is talking about the need for old buildings. She says this, cities need old buildings so badly, it's probably an impossible for vigorous streets and districts to grow. Without them, not museum pieces, sorry, to dist districts to grow without them. Not museum piece old buildings, not old buildings in excellent states of rehabilitation, but a good lot of plain, ordinary, low value buildings, including some rundown ones. It's, if a city area has only new buildings, the enterprises that can exist there are automatically limited to those that can support the high cost of new construction, paying a relatively high overhead, smaller, less profitable businesses and ho households that can only manage low rent are di uh, displaced. So I'm for keeping old buildings. I'm for working with old buildings, re-insulating them. Uh, it's not what's happening in London at the moment where the wrecking ball is everywhere, but this is a really rather lovely one. It's a building which had a very, very deep plan. And this was problematic for our client who was using it as a place for uh, looking after people with long-term mental health problems, unemployed people, uh, a, a, and it had multiple uh, agencies working there. So we created a courtyard. This is a piece of new building at the back. Uh, and the, work, the courtyard works incredibly well as a place where these, where, where these sort of unplanned encounters can ha happen between people uh, in their use of these various different uh, uh, agencies that uh, are operating from within the building. And you know the, the the lovely time you can have with playing with old and new and a patchwork of materials, uh, adding new bits in, and the, the the kind of complexity that comes with working with an old building uh, can be fantastic. There's an interior of that space, and again it you know bursts into life when people start to use it. We're in another project dealing with uh, homelessness here. Another building which could so easily have been knocked down. Uh, and we persuaded our client to save it for the most part. So that part there is facing onto the street. Uh, and we did demolish the back part and came up with quite a radical proposal at the rear. Usually homeless hostels are like this. They're really depressing places uh, for, even, for you and me, but for people who are living with mental health problems, uh, who've perhaps come from the street, uh, who've been kicked out of their homes, this is far from an ideal environment, doors along a dark corridor. We thought that this was better. So it's an arms house typology. This is in Holland, one that we replicated by putting uh, individual rooms, little tiny houses around a courtyard garden. And uh, we presented this image to Camden Council, who were our clients on the project. And we said this, we imagine a group of residents working with a gardener to create and maintain an intensely planted and beautiful garden with an apple tree or two, potatoes, green veg, soft fruit, herbs, a greenhouse, a potting shed and a sunny spot to sit and rest. We think there ought to be a little room or shed in the garden for private chats, one-to-one -one counseling. Conceived as the social heart of the hostel, the garden creates a homely domestic atmosphere. It gives participating residents an interest and an outlet for their energy, helping to foster a sense of belonging, self-worth and empowerment. 
So our client, Camden Council, this is funded by taxpayers' money, built this thing, quite amazing. Each one of those is a tiny house. And although it's a lawn at the moment, when this COVID thing's over, it's going to become a therapeutic gardening project. There'll be somebody comes in, volunteers coming in to work with the guys who a lot of the time are sitting in their rooms to encourage them out and help them to turn this into a wonderful, productive garden. We've done one before in another of our hostels. This, this, is, this is one such, uh, and it's a magic program to introduce. Each one of the houses is, is tiny. You can virtually touch the walls on either side. There's a kitchenette, uh, a, a little sort of sitting space, a shower room, and then you go upstairs onto a bedroom platform. And that's a view looking out of, out of one of those tiny houses back into the garden. So I'm going to rattle through quite quickly. How are we doing for time, Jonah? Okay. So how long have we got? 15. Okay, that's all right. We're doing okay. I'm going to rattle through some of the fairly recent projects. This is a terrace of housing, which we've designed in North London. It's social housing. Fairly conventional townhouses at the front and little courtyard houses for people with mobility problems in wheelchairs at the back. So house, garden, and then courtyards on courtyard houses onto little mews. And we make a big fuss, you know, all the time with the way that our buildings meet the street. So these fantastic arches and these jolly walls. I went on a trip to India with some students and came back and imported that idea back into a sort of London setting. And there are the courtyards, the houses at the back and the view into the interior from the street. This is a row of courtyard houses uh, on a backland site, very difficult backland site in central London. We were told there was no chance of doing housing there because there's so many people's gardens and so on, but they're very introverted little houses. They look into their own courtyard. So there isn't a problem really of privacy at all with the neighbors. Living rooms and kits at the ground floor, two bedrooms upstairs. And there it is. And an interior. This is a row, a, a, a series of row houses in, in, uh, in East London around th uh, three new muses. There's actually a pub on the corner here. It's not something we often get to design uh, and a brewery as well, um, uh, which is pretty interesting in a, in a kind of social housing project uh, that, the, that the, the council would have the kind of uh, interest in, in kind of investing in something for the community like that. So courtyard houses along the street and a taller building, apartment building at the end of the street and where they're looking over the, the green space at one side, these taller four bedroom houses, courtyard houses. And isn't it lovely when you go back and see that? There's the pub. Uh, this is one of the toughest sites we've ever had. It's six meters wide, a grass verge effectively. And we were asked to put some housing for older people on there. So these are a series of cottages looking into each one, looking into a courtyard. There's the site. And there it is built. So these are people moving out of uh, big family, family apartments uh, into smaller cottages for their, old, for their older years. So this is the last little bit. Uh, and it brings me to the sort of paper projects. And um, I, I live in my sketchbooks um, and I think, and I always have, and I think it's a really important part of what we have to do as architects is to imagine something else. Uh, you know, we are every day confronted by the issues uh, which surround us in the city and the terrible, um, in a way, illogic of everything that goes on around us. And, and, and a, a sketchbook is a space in which we can think more adventurously, more speculatively, uh, and perhaps in a way more hopefully about the world that we live in. And, um, and, and there's a conversation that goes on between the stuff in the sketchbooks and the stuff that's got built, uh, you know, things kind of permeate and percolate out of the sketchbooks into the built projects. Um, but I suppose there's a level of ambition and, uh, uh, and perhaps uh, um, sort of speculation, which is difficult to achieve in the here and now. And so to be making drawings like this is a wonderful escape. And we made these models last year, which were just great fun. They're fired clay. 
uh, and this is a you know one so these projects these drawings are supposed to only take five ten minutes each and occasionally they take hold this is one which did obviously take hold it's an island village in the estuary the thames estuary uh, made out of clay dredged from the bottom of the, of the river um, and it's obviously a, a, a glazed um, model which brings me to the the, the, the last project uh, which is in the sort of title of the of the the talk 100 mile city it's a it's an idea again which started as a throwaway sketch and in some ways it still is uh, that um, but it's provocative and it's gained a lot of interest uh, and has promoted some good chats and thoughts and uh, and so on um, it, but I mean it's kind of pretty grandiose in a way the, circ the circumference at its edge of London is 100 miles that's that red line there and London is surrounded by a green belt uh, which is a kind of no build zone or should be uh, and it's a constant battle to try to stop developers sprawling their projects out into the green belt and in a way 100 mile city is a counter blast to that because what it says is that we could build we could solve the housing crisis by building a city which traces that red line probably no more than 100 meters wide uh, but with a very very urban and not suburban edge to the city so there it is, those are fields out there. These are little bungalows, which are, are, are little kind of tiny houses in big gardens. And our city is it kind of winds in and out, creating, following that edge. There it is again, suburbia and um, the, um, uh, the, the, the countryside beyond. So it wouldn't just be housing; it would be uh, it would be schools and, uh, and and factories and all the stuff that the city needs. And a this is a monorail that whizz whizzes around the outside of the city, circling the whole of London. Anyway, I wrote this, and uh, uh, this is fairly much where we're going to end. Uh, build a street-based linear city, a hundred miles long, a hundred meters wide, and four stories high. Wrap it round London. Give it little factories, schools, houses and shops laid out in terraces along intimately scaled streets and around squares. Make it a dense, intense edge to London, a confident, purposeful boundary fronting a revitalized, productive countryside. 100 Mile City is a linear Barceloneta, a circular Rome, a stretched Porto, Serbia, suburbia reprogrammed, hybridized, compressed, catalytic urbanism en fleek. Ride the 100 mile high speed orbital monorail, souped up skyfly circle line, the loose ends and frayed edges of London's transport system, its isolated city edge train and bus termini instantly, meaningfully, usefully connected with circus ride technology. So that's that thing there, those rails. London has a fantastic transport system like many cities with a kind of radial like spokes going out to the suburbs. But if you wanna get from one part of the suburbs to, to, to another, it's, it's very difficult. And our, our circle line, our, our um, monorail would connect the end of all of those termini and, and kind of make more sense of the whole, the whole system. And in time, watch our city grow inwards, because this could just be the start. And rather than the city sprawling outwards into the countryside, it could kind of move inwards through suburbia. And in time, watch our city grow inwards, spreading like a wildfire through wasteful, antisocial, car-choked suburbia. Eastward from Richmond, west across the Newham Marshes, up from Eltham, across the hills of Greenwich and the empty green swords and golf courses of Enfield. Metroland consolidated, backfilled, integrated and urbanised. London for 40 million people, a kind of inside out plan voisin, ville radieuse, blighty style. So that's our, that's our monorail. In fact, it's not our monorail, it's the one in Wuppertal in Germany. It's the most fantastic way of getting around a town. And, and so picture that going around the outside or just, just inside our city. And little moments of this model, it's a, it's a, it's a plaster cast model, uh, little streets and you know, arched front, front frontages facing onto these plowed fields and suburbia beyond. We imagine a sort of livestock market happening here. So, you know, drovers bringing their stuff 
in from the countryside just outside the city. So that's us, that's it. So I stopped sharing, shall I? There we are. That was a fantastic lecture, Peter. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jonah, behind the scenes for making all that work too. Um, Florian and Sarah, would you um, uh, put your cameras on? So we're going to start the discussion um, with um, with Florian and Sarah with some things that are, I think are particularly um, pertinent to, to their work in connection with yours. Um, so Florian, to start with you, you've use some similar strategies in your housing designs to, to some of the things that Peter has um, just talked about, notably the use of courtyards and, and rethinking circulation. Do you have any observations or any questions um, for Peter about how a street-based architecture um, functions in different or plays out in different urban conditions? Um, well, there's a lot to talk about, Peter. Thank you so much. It's so broad, and there's many thoughts that that came up, and indeed things that you know we we reflect on in our own work uh, as well. So, so I have many questions, Rosalie, but I may, but we will start. May, well, and I don't want to ask all the questions because I I see there's many people. There were 300 people on the, or 340 people joined with a lot of questions there as well. So, um, yeah, around circulation, and maybe it has to do with the. Like we talk a lot about the, the the relationship between the street and your front door, and in some way, in in your cases, you're trying to bring the front door as close to the street right as possible to avoid sort of any uh, corridors or interior spaces. I wonder maybe you could speak about that on the larger scale projects because there's a lot of fine grain, smaller scale projects where it's quite easy to get the street right or the front door on the street itself to have as, as many addresses, so to say, as possible. Um, in the larger projects, we, we are trying to work through exterior circulation, so to never have an interior corridor, which obviously also um, produces a lot of exterior facade. And our struggle is always the, the amount of exterior, so to say, also with energy uh, uh, requirements. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, the, the sort of, of and cost as well, right? A compact building with an interior corridor is much cheaper than a, than a building with a lot of exteriority and a lot of uh, um, circulation. So maybe you could speak about sort of the way you, you negotiate um, the amount of exteriority that you're producing uh, in these constraints of, of, of cost and energy requirements. Well, so I suppose there's a couple of, uh, couple of issues there. One is, uh, um, you know, our argument to it's some of our some of our projects are for local authorities, some are for private developers. So one has to kind of win the, the commercial argument. Uh, and our, our our argument for this form of housing, which kind of tends to eliminate uh, interior circulation, um, is that uh, we're building about twenty percent less uh, floor space. So your yeah. five million pound building suddenly becomes where becomes four million pounds, or or theoretically it does. So it's a really powerful argument for trying to eliminate circulation in the way that you describe. Um, some of the some of the projects there do have a high ratio of external wall to floor, which I think is what you're getting yeah. at in terms of heat loss and, and cost, but not all of them. So the McGrath Road back to back housing, clearly because it's back to back, um, it eliminates one four, you know, one quarter of, of, of what uh, you know, external wall that mo most houses would have, or even a half if it's a terrace house. Um, Peckham Road, which is the one with lots of steps, yes, I think that it, that it's fair to say that um, it's not efficient in terms of heat loss, other than the fact that we've got to have a hell of a lot of insulation in those walls. Um, and I think, but I think there's other criticisms one could make from an ecological perspective of our stuff. Um, the materials are, you know, uh, pretty carbon heavy, bricks and concrete and so on. And we'd love to have an opportunity to experiment more with other materials, uh, although the building industry in this country is very conservative. Yeah, so I was wondering maybe if I can have one more question, Rosalie, I know there's many, but um, about materiality and, and indeed your first uh, project started with a very sort of a Mediterranean, you know, almost Cisayasca white uh, uh, solution, but gradually I see that you moved from shingles to indeed brick. Um, yeah, so maybe you can speak in general around uh, materiality, and maybe in addition to it, I think the, the, the ability, because it, clearly you want to give space for the inhabitant to also put its mark on, the, on, on their home, right, through transformation, through exterior spaces. And do you think, so brick is, for instance, easier to change, so to say, than maybe this white, large plaster walls. Is that something where you actually create also space for the people to work on their homes as they 
or is it all rent? Is it all rental? No, some of them are. They will become the owner of the home as well. Yeah, but it's a bit of a mixture, a bit of a okay. mixture. Yeah. But I think it's a very, very interesting point. I mean, when we did Donnybrook, I, I, I was kind of a new convert to Alvaro Caesar and people like that, and Louis Barragan, um, another hero, uh, and obviously you know Adolf Loos and Corbusier. And I was probably a little bit uptight about wanting to be an architect, you know. And, uh, I, I, and, and, and I think you're absolutely right. I think brick is a, is a it's softer material, it ages better. It is, people, people probably feel less uptight around it so they can sort of, um, as you say, change it and knock windows in it and uh, grow stuff up it without feeling anxious. So I think it's, it's a good move really. Um, you know, clearly the, the white stuff, the, the wonderful shadows you get and painting with light as Corbusier called it. But um, I'm a bit more relaxed about all that stuff. Um, that particular project has been really well looked after, but another one of our projects uh, has just been completely ignored by the, 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 the landlord. He's a big landlord, and um, it looks terrible after 10 years. Yeah. So you, yeah. They're no good if you don't look after them, those buildings. Yeah. Timber, I think, is a very interesting thing. And we've got uh, we, our, our, our city government in London is going to take a lot of persuading to allow us to build in timber because they're very worried. We had a very big, uh, a disastrous fire uh, last year. and. Um, but I think they're, they're going too much the other way. I think timber is possibly the future in terms of eco ecology, yeah. and but both in terms of structure and cladding. And um, But we're a bit hamstrung by the regulations at the moment in that regard, and we're lobbying government to see if we can change that. Thanks. Um, so, you know, so many, you, you talk a lot about learning from traditional forms, and a lot of regulation actually has been created um, in, in London, in New York and cities in many places to um, kind of squash traditional forms in some ways. So Sarah, you've done a lot of work on the role of housing regulation and its effect in, um, in sometimes thwarting the capacity of designers and clients to meet the need for um, housing. I wonder what observations you might offer in connection with um, the issue of regulation and, and Peter's work and inventiveness in general in housing design and policy. Yes, well, first, thank you so much for your presentation, Peter. It's absolutely stunning projects. Um, so yeah, I work for um, Citizens Housing and Planning Council. We're a, a research group focused on housing policy. So it's really, you know, our main interest is how the public sector underpinning can be structured in the best way so that you know the the right sort of architecture and development can flourish in a city um, and there's so many tensions there across the world that's what housing policy is always trying to wrestle with and i think your presentation like you know really brought out a lot of those tensions that we're playing with constantly um, you know, a lot of the work we're doing is that there's, there is this word social housing that is growing in the US um, about and what that really means, like sort of it, historically in Europe, social housing has become its own definition. It's kind of used in, in, interchangeably with affordable housing. Sometimes council housing is meshed in with it. But I do think the, the just the term social housing and why it's of so much interest in the States is a lot of the themes that that you're describing which is we want our architecture and development to be meeting the needs of the population and society as a whole and really understanding you know, the role that architecture can play in that. Um, and I think so much of your work, you, you didn't even quite sort of directly say it because I think it's so assumed now with social housing in Europe that you're paying attention to what households, what families really need in terms of their their homes from the unit to the building to the street level. And it's it's still very underutilized as a planning process and a and design process in the States. I think because a lot of our regulations and both the regulations that dictate design, but then also our subsidy regulations, even just the actual act of our housing authorities directly um you know is still not really it's it it actually thwarts the ability for you to respond to how people you know really live and i think you know in a way it's it means so useful for cities to be looking to towards each other for the innovation and how to advance in that because i think there's always things that we can learn from each other but i do think in a way London over the last 30 years, despite the decimation of council housing, you know, being a part of that, 
you know, you talked about the successes of post-war council housing, but but ultimately there was sort of a paternalistic problem. There was a like, we'll just build it. We, it's not really like you said, it's the, it was part of the slum clearance, getting rid of um, an idea of how people did actually live and, and, you know, radically replacing that. And I think what has been interested in, interesting in the last 30 years in the UK is this process of actually involving residents. Um, it's something that we're trying to learn from, from our housing authority in New York, who is 30 years behind in terms of like talking to the residents about anything about their rehabilitation of their homes. Like there's zero role for residents, you know, in affordable housing or in, in public housing. And I think, you know, the UK has become really advanced in that. So I wondered if you could talk just a little bit more about um, how you think the public sector has moved to facilitate that so that your work actually can respond to what people really need, their real lives. And then more directly, um, that process of, of hearing from residents and incorporating it in what you design. Well, I mean, I, I, um, I don't feel quite as uh, optimistic as the right word, but um, I, I feel quite dissatisfied with the extent to which that, that does actually happen in London. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's quite a lot of lip service paid to it, uh, but I think for, for it to really uh, work well, we might need to think, and you, you hinted at it when you were talking about the post-war housing being very top down, we might need to think more about the means of production. And um, what I mean by that is that, you know, if, if the sort of paternalistic top down, amazing um, post-war um, housing construction uh, at huge scale was done, might we not think about a, a, a more uh, devolved and bottom-up kind of means of, of making social housing, so housing co-ops and, um, and, and things like that. And, and the great thing about that is then suddenly you don't need the regulations. The regulations are there to protect us from the unscrupulous developers, to regulate kind of local authorities. But if you've got a bunch of people uh, employing their own architect, being funded by the government to do that, in order to create their own social housing, they're going to want the housing they want, you know, and you don't need to tell them that it's got to be a 12 square meter bedroom because they might want a nine square meter bedroom, a slightly bigger living room. So I think if, if it, it would, it would benefit, it benefit us in lots of ways if we had a more a devolved kind of and um, um, means, means of making our, uh, our architecture. It's not unheard of. I, I heard um, the, that in Uruguay, 60% of social housing is made by small cooperatives uh, who get the housing that they want and, and it's funded by central government. So, so then, because you know, when they have uh, regulations, uh, uh, it assumes a kind of Mr. and Mrs. entirely normal, doesn't it? it? It assumes that we're all the same and of course we're not, you know. What, what do you find are the, are, the, are the biggest regulatory barriers still to the, facing your work? That, that thwart your, you being able to respond to what people and society really needs? Well, I mean, we've got books, there's a whole book, there's a whole kind of bookshelf, you know, up there of, of stuff that um, we're supposed to do and um, we either do or pretend to do, um, you know, w whether it's, um, I mean, the, you know, publicly funded projects, they're very specific about the size of every room, the amount of storage, kitchen storage cupboards, you know, space for cat food, um, you know, it, it, the mind boggles and um, there's not a lot of wiggle room, really. I don't quite know. We're quite Machiavellian, but I don't, we, we find a way around them usually, but not as much as we'd like to. Interestingly, the, 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 the housing for um, homeless people, there are virtually no regulations about what we can do there. And uh, um, so it made it possible for us to do those peculiar little houses, which um, you wouldn't want to live in for your whole life, but they're, they're nicer than the usual sort of 10 square meter room or dormitory that people often live in. Um, but they would, they don't comply with any kind of regulation for, for, for general needs housing, but they're, they're really nice for te temporary accommodation. So I'm going to, we have a ton of um, questions in the Q and A. So here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to, I am going to ask you a question because I have a big question I want to ask you. Um, and then I'm going to ask Florian and Sarah um, along with me to scroll through the Q&A and to choose out some of those questions if you would. And also um, 
you know, Florian, you said you had lots more questions yourself. Um, you can intersperse your own with um, right. with um, some things that you choose from the Q and A. But we'll, so we'll try and do it that way. And we also, I believe, we're able to um, hold on to the questions in the Q and A, and we will try after the lecture with ones that we're not able to get to to um, find a way to respond to them. So, Peter, here's my question for you. Um, You've said that you think that we need to, um, and I, I, I will preface this by saying I love this idea that I think I totally agree with you. You've said that you think that we need to redistribute economic activity away from London to parts of the UK that have thousands of empty and underused homes. Could you talk a little bit, especially given what you just said about bottom up and the um, you know self generated? Could you talk a little bit about your vision of how that could happen and the balance of centralized and local responsibility for that could make um, this work? Yeah. So I, I got I heard a statistic the other day, and I don't know if it's reflected at all in states or other parts of the world, but certainly true of here. That there are about 350,000 empty homes in the United Kingdom in, or in Great Britain. That's a hell of a lot. And, uh, and there are about 350,000 homeless people. You know, so that's partly because of that, 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 the sorts of uh, pension fund kind of uh, projects, which is just empty and, and investment vehicles. But it's also because there are areas of our country where there, is, there, are, there aren't jobs and so have become depopulated and areas of um, our towns which are like that. So, so, it, 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 so then it does make you wonder about whether the 100 mile city is a terribly good idea because it might not actually be necessary at all. Maybe it's just about going and uh, trying to, as you say, redirect um, um, economic activity to areas which need help. And um, I, I, you know, I think that's what government should be doing. I, I, and I'm for a sort of planned economy to some extent and, and I think just allowing the market to decide everything you know, the market doesn't have a brain it just just swirls around and does kind of what it feels like for its own benefit and doesn't really help very much so um, I'd like to I think that's what we should be discussing in our country at the moment about trying to allocate resources encourage business to move back into some of these other places um, so clearly that is a kind of very top-down kind of thing um, but but um, the means by which that would be done, I, I, I think, um, would, would want to be encouraging the individual and perhaps smaller businesses to go there. But government can play its part in, in kind of uh, enabling people um, um, and, and, and empowering them. Um, Florian, do you want to, um, do you have a question that you'd like to either from Q and A or from your own that you'd like well, to? Was, maybe there's there's one that I I see here that maybe we can combine with a question I had myself and maybe that ties into what you were just uh, speaking about, which is um, something around typology and uh, also um, say um, mobility or like uh, the like there's there's very few there's there's streets in your in your buildings but no or, or in your in your plants but no cars. Um, but is there bike storage or what is the way in which you, and, and specifically also if we speak about sort of spreading out again, people obviously there's questions around sort of, you know, the, the car as a, as a versus density. That, that's one part of the question is like, how does your, uh, like, how do you address sort of uh, a, a move away from the car, so to say, in, in the typology of the home? And maybe connected to that, there's a question here from Howard Davis, which speaks that the UK has some of the smallest dwelling sizes in Europe. And so you do a lot with, you know, with that small um, um, sort of um, set of, 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 of um, requirements. But have you looked into other like non-standard ways of living, uh, meaning where it's not just sort of uh, designed around the poor family or like a, a couple, so to say, but larger homes for more collective types living? So maybe those are two questions, but they're both a typological question of like how to accommodate, you know, for different types of mobility and how do you accommodate for sort of different ways of living together? Yeah, so so we're very lucky in London to have a, quite an amazing public transport system, but that doesn't operate in all areas, and um, the, the the projects are a little bit different in the way that they deal with that. I mean, Donnybrook, the white one at the beginning, we designed it to have, I think, ten parking spaces down the middle. So, uh, and in the end, the planning department said they would rather not have them. They felt there was adequate public transport 
uh, for, um, to, for people to use, and it hasn't inhib inhibited the take up of those homes. We're doing another project, I didn't show it today, which is in a very suburban location, miles away from, a, a, well, 15 minutes walk from a tube station. Uh, and it was felt that there needs to be cars. It's on a very conveniently sloping site. So we've managed to use the kind of levels to have an undercroft of car parking. Uh, there are very um, prescriptive uh, regulations about, as you say, about cycle storage. Um, so it, it would be a different matter if we were doing stuff out of town where the density wasn't adequate to support a public support public transport. It's really chicken and egg, isn't it? Um, um, so, so on the other, what was the other question? About sort of non-standard, uh, um, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, um, wouldn't that be nice? So, so again, one is slightly hamstrung by, um, by kind of regulations that we've already discussed with Sarah, um, but, but also by conservatism. And we have talked to, to groups of people, um, um, very often sort of homeowners, uh, who wants to try to build a sort of co-op project and uh, um, uh, and there are a few of those around in London. We haven't got involved directly in one yet. I mean, I've, one of the things, talking about sort of non-standard ways of living, and it might sound strange to you, but um, I've got quite involved in, in one of the hostels that we have built. And um, to the extent that I got, I, I helped to to do the gardening and we put it as a company, we put in some money to do the garden. Uh, and I went to the market and, and it, was, it was a fantastic process because it was getting to know the stories of some of the people who live in homeless hostels. And we went, my partner and I went to uh, a couple of times to dinner. They have a kind of dinner uh, thing on a Wednesday night where everybody comes out of their rooms and comes down. And um, I was really struck by the fact or the idea that this was a kind of model for being, and it wasn't necessarily middle-class, wealthy middle-class families kind of buying into a co-op, but it was a group of people who were living together and being incredibly supportive of one another in the most, you know, touching ways. Um, and they, you know, when we, when we encounter homeless people in the street, there was a kind of barrier, but to be able to sit down with people and, and chat to them about what, where they're going and how they got to where they are, um, and to see people's genuine concern for one another, cooking for one another, looking after one. I remember one day we had a, a guy, we were doing the gardening project. There was a guy up in his room who's severely depressed. He's a, a, a you know, d depressed, um, bipolar. And I'd seen him before and he's really happy, but on this occasion, and, and a bunch of three or four of them went up to him and brought him down to the garden and helped him to plant a tree or something like that. And it was just, wow, you know. So it made me think about other ways of, of living rather than just being in a house, as you say, on your own, isolated and um, going off to work and going to the shops and, yeah. yeah. Sarah, are there some questions that you'd like to put? Yeah, I was interested in, um, some, some people asked in the chat about pushback against density. I wonder what your experience is with that process and arguments against and, and how you play with that tension, because that obviously is a, 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 a thing that we hear a lot about in terms of public sector, the public opposition to density, as well as like the public sector's view on it, um, assumed view on it. Um, and then also if you if if you're building your projects at like much bigger scale, I wondered um, how you might incorporate some of the design techniques um, to like support community and people's lives. Like, what would you, what would need to change if you were doing it at sort of a mass scale? Well, I mean, it just, uh, doing your second one first, it disappoints me that we aren't able. Uh, it's because of the way that things are organised that it's it's quite hard to persuade our clients, whether they're in the lo local authorities or private clients, to have things that aren't housing in their projects. You, at Donnybrook with those three shops at the front. We wanted, we wanted a, a, a doctor's surgery in there, uh, which because of the way that the funding was timed, it just, you know, it, it ought to be easy to do these things. So, so at a bigger scale, you, you'd want the infrastructure to be available, um, whether it's places for people to work uh, or, or go to the doctor or, 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 and all that sort of stuff. And, um, 
clearly if one's working in a bigger scale, one can't ignore those things. I mean, we're doing a project in Germany at the moment where things are a bit different actually. And they're, before they build the housing, they're building a park, they're building a beer hall, because they're Germans, uh, they're building uh, there's a zoo. Uh, so they're doing all this stuff. And then when, the, when, the, when all that's done, they want to put the housing in. So the infrastructure is really important to them. Um, in our sort of rather overheated housing market in London, those sorts of things can easily be left by the wayside. There was another bit of the question, wasn't there, Sarah? Um, about the opposition to density. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, you look at our stuff, it's, it's not mad dense, is it? I mean, it, 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 it's, and, and, it, and it doesn't look all that dense because it's quite low rise. So, I mean, the, 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 the back to back housing, which we showed, which is four story, houses with everybody getting a house, everybody getting a roof terrace. The, the council, when they came to us, was expecting a six or seven storey apartment building, plonked in the middle of the site with lots of space around it, lots of circulation inside, which just bumps up. So I, I think um, the, the people, when, 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 when there's a development going up, people, local people can get very anxious and worried about it. But if you come along and say, actually, we're building some row housing, and they're expecting a block of flats. It's, it's, it's something which very often finds favor with them. It's a particularly an English thing, possibly. I think it may not be the same in the States, but people like houses and they like, and also very often our, project, our projects are offering a, a new street through or a public space. There's a, there's a public spiritedness to it, which I think is people recognize. So I haven't encountered that actually. We, we often get lots of support um, from local people with our projects and we said there's certainly no problem with people taking up uh, the, the, the projects despite the fact they are relatively high density they're not high rise and i think that's a for sure there, there is um I, I i'm wondering if you can speak about the the residents in a little bit more particular and, and maybe this is a larger question and a discussion but basically um also if we look at the chat there's a number of like <coughs> your your work of course, very British and very much taking, you know, pre precedence that you can find in London. But there is obviously, you know, and you referred to Naples, um, there, are, there are other references maybe in non-European, you know, uh, places of the, of the world where there is a vernacular and a, and a density. Um, and I'm wondering for, in, in the council housing, what is the demographics of the people that, that, that end up living there and sort of how do you negotiate? I can imagine that, you know, the UK is a very diverse um, uh, uh, country, um, how do you negotiate sort of the, the Britishness to an extent of that work? That's maybe one part of the question. And the second would be, um, and that's happening also uh, quite a bit you know, more and more, is the involvement of the residents ultimately in the design process itself. And so do you work through um, with, with, say, representatives of future tenant groups or, or what have you through sort of these processes? And how do you, how do you speak then about sort of psychology, uh, vernacular, and, and what, is, what does living mean? Well, I mean, it, it comes back to, you know, Sarah's point about how you engage with people. And um, it's, it's very, very difficult because uh, the way things that are, all, are, all, are organized, mostly not always, because we are working sometimes in well-established estates where the conversation with people who live there already is, is fantastic. Uh, but very often it's a, it's a site uh, where we will never meet the people who are going to live there. Um, and it's to do again with the means of production. I mean, uh, Karl, Karl Marx said, we're a stranger to, th to the things we make, uh, which I think is very beautiful about uh, when thinking about sort of division of labor and how, uh, and, uh, and I think we're very distanced, but because we're working for um, a, perhaps a council who will have a, a, a list of people somewhere which they might put in the building in the end. And so we, 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 and then we've got a builder also in the way. And so we're so distant from them. And, and I think, um, you know, what uh, Sarah was saying about the engagement and trying to find ways of being be better engaged, I think it's really important. And again, this the idea of a sort of a, a more of a bottom up approach to how housing production would, would help that. Could I just ask one follow-up? The, the one the one project you talked about was for extended families. You did a seven bedroom. Was that was that specifically stated by the council as the need? Yes, yes. Uh, there were a, a fairly large Islamic community living in the other buildings and further afield right. on the estate. Um, and in that instance, we were able to talk to people and understand uh, better understand their requirements, um, particularly in terms of their cultural the need for separation within the home uh, and that was that was helpful 
and that can be a strength because it's an existing community to be able yeah. to build on what they what they need like rehab and infill projects are have that strength rather than a, just a, a general private site Exactly. I mean, we've we, we done one uh, a couple of years ago where we were invited to the council. Uh, we were we were chosen by the community in a, in a sort of, a, a, you know, like a beauty parade. And um, and we worked with them over a period of about a year uh, on sort of Saturdays and weekend evening, exhausting, actually, but very illuminating. And um, the, the big decision was, do you want your estate to be knocked down and rebuilt or would you like it? to be improved and, and refurbished. And um, it, it was the latter, thankfully. And, um, but it was just, it was wonderful being able to, and they knew, they knew their manner, as we call it in London, they, they, knew, they knew their patch better than, a hundred times better than we did. And it was very fascinating and helpful. We're, we're, we're trying to do work with public housing tenants in New York in exactly the same way, trying to, elevate their voices so they actually have a role to play in what what the new shape what the rehab of their sites actually could look like brilliant yeah can i Rosie, i know that we are uh, you're on time but i think there's a number of questions which is on a very different topic which is basically about the scale of your office and the work that requires so much detail you said there's also a builder in the way so how do you manage basically to um, you know, accommodate such an attention to, to this detail in the process because it is very much in the execution as well, where these things can either succeed or fall apart. Well, we, we uh, um, nobody ever leaves our office. I don't, I don't mean they don't go home at night, I mean they're, they're with me a long time. You can go in, but you cannot go out. That storefront has a one, it's a one way entrance. Yeah. And people know how it works. There's a small, it's a pretty efficient group um so so six or seven of us we have a year out student who's in in between the two bits of the course who's very key to the process they kind of manage the office you know ordering stuff in but they're also very involved with me in the in the very early stages of the project we don't do as lots of architects do tons of options for presentation to the client we give them one option but that option can kind of change and you know kind of meander and things like that but, the, but i have worked in offices where you know, there are 10 options and then the director comes down and reduces it down to five and then it's shown to the client, it's reduced down to three. And, you, you know, it's it, the, the prolifer, prolifer, proliferation of options can be really sapping, I think, to, to, to creative process. So we, we do that. We, as I say, we work with pencils rather than com computers. And I can, I bet I, it's a bit like um, John Henry and the steam drill. I, I could bet I could crank out a, a perspective quicker than anybody on a computer. Um, um, and um, you know, so we're pretty pretty efficient. And and the other thing is that we, you know, the themes that I described at the beginning of this project, the ideas that run through at, at the beginning of the lecture, the ideas that run through it, don't change. We don't. I don't sit down with a blank sheet of paper every time and go, "Oh right, what should we do this time?" You know, you can probably tell that you're looking around on the walls is that there are themes that recur and ideas. There are typologies that we reproduce. You know, which work well in one situation. Um, so we're not reinventing the wheel every time. Uh, uh, London is a complicated place to design because it's not a grid. It's there are complicated geometries to the site. Yeah. So there's always weird atypicals, which actually are quite fun and challenging to do. But there is repetition. And also in the detailing of the projects, you know, you can see there are, you know, we've got a sort of fairly good sort of stock of standard details. So we're not, again, we're not having to kind of draw it completely fresh every time. You work with um, repeat contractors for the projects or with a, a kind of um, ongoing team of consultants? Uh, yeah, we, you know, often, often clients are very happy for us to recommend consultants because if the team's working well, uh, we've got some contractors who we really like working with who, you know, they, they price it well because they know how, they built relatively, um, relatively easily these projects, many of them. You know, they're just, they're just brick arches. There's no steel work. Uh, and um, there's one one contractor in particular who's done quite a few of those projects, and he wins the tenders because he knows how to build them already, and he, he knows he can go in pretty keen on them. Um, yeah, it's nice so, to develop relationships like that. We're almost at time, and I want to end with um, two related questions about the agency of architecture. Um, and I'm going to read these two. Um, one of them is the very first question that we got, which was, um, "What do you think about?" the direct role architects play in the housing crisis by taking on, oops, who, who just moved that one? 
What was that? Does it disappear? Uh, it disappeared. Sorry, <laughs> I'm not going to um, finish reading um, that one. Here's the, what do you think about the direct role architects play in the housing crisis by taking on luxury housing projects that contribute to the commodification of both housing and design? What are the implications of this for questions of architectural agency? And then the other kind of related question is, um, with regards to your opening on the need for social or council housing, how do you propose architects can provide or be part of the solution? For example, in the UK, private developers are required to allocate a portion of units to be affordable. However, to use the Battersea Power Station development as an example, developers were allowed to reduce the number of affordable housing units from an already measly 15% to an embarrassing 9% citing unforeseen costs such as needing to refurbish grade two listed buildings and having to fund the new tube stations, both of which argue, arguably add value to their developments. Yeah, I mean, it's a game a little bit uh, and you know, where, where you've got a good uh, local authority, they'll stick to their guns uh, um, and you know, developers will have all the consultants in the world to say that they're not gonna make any money out of their project. Uh, and, but a, you know, a good a good local authority will stick to the stick to their guns, and you know, um, I, I, you know, we've been quite grateful to local authorities where we've been working, and perhaps developers wanted to reduce it, and uh, it, we don't have we don't have any power in that, but the local authority can uh, and and should, and and often does, but obviously it hasn't worked in Battersea. And the other question was about sort of um, sort of the morality, isn't it? Of uh, I think, you know, in a way, we all live in this system and we have to survive in it and to some extent are perhaps all a bit slightly hypocritical. And um, but we, we had to make our own judgments about, you know, the jobs that we take on. Um, and um, I haven't turned down too many in my life, but I have to turn down a few if I felt really uncomfortable. Um, but I, I don't think it's I don't. I think we have to make our own. It's a judgment call, really. Any job's a judgment call, and um, it's it's for the individual um, to 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 make that that make that judgment call. How would you, as a kind of follow up, up on that, on your, um, you know, um, how would you like to see architects um, used? I mean, I know that you're a huge admirer of Neve Brown of, and I believe of the public architects um, of the post-war era. So if you were, um, this is a small question, if you were reorganizing the system, um, how, what other kinds of opportunities might you create for architects to do their work? Beyond well, I, I've, 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 you know, it's easier said than done, probably, but I have touched on it a few times. The idea of architects being much more closely related to um, the people they're making the houses for, and that that's going to re sort of require rethinking the sort of means by which you know funding works and uh, projects are managed and things like that. It'd be lovely if it was less top down. Is that what you were sort of driving at? I I think. Well, also whether you see as desirable a future larger cadre of public architects. I mean, the the public architect is not such a um, common phenomenon um, as it was. No, no, and you know, all of the most of the uh, public architecture departments were disbanded, and so the the, the resources aren't there, the, the know how isn't there. But that could be turned around, and um, you know, uh, as you say, in the '60s, people were some of the best people, best students were recruited from architecture schools. Lee Brown being one of them, uh, and and it was you know where you wanted to work because it was where the interesting stuff was happening. Um, and until I think government starts putting money into uh, public housing and public housing being produced by local authorities in house, then um, there isn't really there aren't many opportunities. Although there is a really interesting program uh, going on at the moment called Public Practice, in which there is funding available for architects to go and work in local authorities uh, and to advise on the inside, to, like some mole within their, their these organisations, which can be terribly um, kind of uh, uh, uncreative, uh, and and so so Central London. Uh, government, the GLA, is funding people to be parachuted into, you know, planning departments and 
housing departments. And it's having a very interesting ripple effect, uh, but quite quite small scale, but very effective. And when we're dealing with a planning department who has one of these public practice people in there, it, it, there's somebody you can appeal to and, and, and interesting things can happen. Huh. Well, thank you so, so much for a really great lecture and um, lots of uh, incredibly stimulating work to learn lots from for all of us. Thank you, Flori, and thank you, Sarah, and thank you everybody for coming. Well, thanks for having me and nice to meet you guys and uh, uh, see you in New York, New York one day, Rosalie. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>